Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, friends. Uh, my name is Sambit Nayak. I'm working as a climate change mitigation consultant for CDCN. I have here with me my colleague, Ms. Judy, who is helping us with the webinar platform. Uh, today, we are going to have a webinar on a very interesting session, which is on financing mechanism and business models for supporting energy efficiency measure. This webinar is hosted by CTCN in collaboration with BASE and PwC India. Uh, before we move to the detailed presentations by the team from BASE and PwC, I would like to give you a quick introduction of CTCN, about CTCN, how it works. Thank you, Judy. Uh, can you go to the next page, please, Judy? Thank you. CDCN Climate Technology Center and Network is an implementation arm of UNF C technology mechanism with a mission to promote the accelerated development and transfer of climate technologies at the request of developing countries for energy efficient, low carbon and climate resilient development. Uh, CTCN is hosted by two UN agencies. One is UN Environment Program and next one is UNIDO. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, yeah, next slide please. CTCN is offering services under three uh, service areas, uh, which are um, technical assistance. Uh, can we go to the previous page, Judy? Yeah, CTCN services are uh, spanned in three service areas, technical assistance, knowledge sharing, and collaboration and networking. Uh, we solve the technology, uh, we provide the technology solutions under two broad areas, mitigation and adaptation, as well as on the cross-sectoral issues. Can we go to the next page, please? CDCN is currently working on 200 plus technology transfer interventions uh, to support 100 plus countries uh, under its technical assistance. Next page, please. So if I give you a brief about the kind of technical assistance CDCN is dealing, uh, it varies from decision making tools and information process, uh, feasibility studies, technology uh, identification and prioritization, sectoral roadmaps and strategies. Uh, they are mostly uh, under the mitigation and adaptation sectors. Can we go to the next page, please? So CTCN is a network of uh, 600 plus organization, which represents uh, private sector organization, research and academic institution, non-government organization, not-for-profit organization, and public sector organizations, which are having uh, expertise in the field of energy efficiency, renewable energy, water, waste management, and many other areas in adaptation and mitigation. Can we go to the next page, please? For those who are not aware about the CTCN technical assistance process, uh, the request for CTCN technical assistance is generated by an interested party in the developing countries who contact their national focal point, which we call national designated entity, to request a technical assistance. Then the national designated entity confirms after reviewing uh, the alignment of the request with its national climate priorities and passes it along to CTCN. In the next process, the CTCN collaborates with the NDE and applicants to develop a tailored technology transfer plan. The CTCN then develop a refined uh, request, which is a response plan, which uh, comprises the terms of reference, a detailed budget, and which is ready to go for a bidding and selection of an implementing partner. So with this, uh, I'm done with the brief introduction of CTCN. Uh, as we all know that energy efficiency is a very important and first milestone for any uh, energy conservation program and it has a larger potential to generate sizable economic and environmental benefits. So let's uh, tune in to 
some interesting case studies from base and pwc which will uh, showcase how financing mechanism and business model has supported to implement energy efficiency measure without wasting further time i would like to give the floor to my colleague laura who would be moderating this uh, webinar uh, uh, and she is uh, she is right now here with us laura over to you thank you Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on financing instruments and business models for energy efficient technologies. Uh, I'm Laura Corella from BASE, the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy, and it's my pleasure today to moderate this webinar organized by CTCN, BASE and PwC India. Uh, the webinar today will provide an overview of innovative financing mechanism business models that support investments in energy efficiency. The webinar will cover mechanisms that have the potential to support the uptake of energy efficient technologies for different end user groups, including the residential, the commercial and the public sector. Each speaker will illustrate the models with case studies from around the world. We will first hear from the speakers and at the end we'll also have some time for questions uh, from the audience. And please you can also you can ask your questions using the, Q, the question chat below. And yes, on the next slide, we have here the agenda, uh, but without further ado, uh, I would like to invite our first speaker, Daniel Magallon. Next slide. Uh, Daniel is base managing director, leading numerous projects aimed at developing innovative business models to mobilize financing to sustainable energy and climate change solution. Daniel will provide an overview of the main investment barrier that energy efficiency faces today. Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, and, and thank you very much to the CTCN for this opportunity to present uh, this uh, energy efficiency and some of the solutions that we have been implementing um, around the world. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, BASE is um, a Swiss uh, non-for-profit entity, it was founded 20 years ago uh, as an effort uh, between the private sector and the public sector and together with the UN environment to build a center that it's dedicated um, fully to develop innovative uh, financial mechanisms and business models that help to accelerate investments uh, to climate change solutions and especially in, uh, to sustainable energy. So in that we have been working uh, for many years in energy efficiency uh, around the world. Next one please. So these are the areas that we normally are focused. We have a, a special focus in renewable energy, in energy efficiency. As well, we have programs and business models for energy access. We have a very strong area as well that works with electric mobility. And we work a lot as well with financial institutions and, and climate-related uh, funds or international funds. This is, this is where BASE uh, has been active. Next one, please. These are the countries where we have been uh, implementing projects uh, around the world. So we have been active in Latin America, Africa, and Asia as well, and in some countries in Europe. Next one, please. So, well, today we, we are going to be presenting uh, some of these uh, mechanisms about energy efficiency. And before that, I want to give a, a broad context about what does that mean in, in terms of challenges and opportunities. The first, the, the first point is to realize that energy efficiency is quite, quite broad. Uh, when we talk about energy efficiency, as you know, it includes the residential, household uh, energy efficiency that could include, for example, appliances. As well, uh, we can talk about energy efficiency in the commercial or the industrial sector, for uh, industrial processes or for uh, services like in hotels, for example. As well, we have uh, energy efficiency in the public sector. And here we can include uh, um, lighting, uh, street lighting, uh, and pu public buildings uh, uh, services. And as well, we can include transportation and, ve and uh, vehicles in, in energy efficiency. So each of these uh, uh, groups or sectors uh, represent opportunities, but as well, they, they have specific barriers and risks that needs to be uh, addressed. The next one, please. So what, what uh, do I mean in terms of uh, opportunity and challenges with energy efficiency in general? Uh, for instance, uh, normally energy efficiency uh, investments are small compared to 
uh, large scale renewable energy projects, for example, uh, as well, they tend to um, have a little bit more of upfront, a higher upfront investment than other uh, um, investment uh, or energy, uh, um, other appliances. For example, in this graphic, what we are looking is uh, to compare in two different equipments, one that is a conventional equipment and one that is an efficient equipment. And normally the one that it's high efficient, you require to give a, a little bit more upfront investment even when in the long term, the operational costs are uh, lower. And here comes this point about the lack of trust because the, the, the investors or the ones that have to take a decision to invest in energy efficiency uh, have to take that uh, step uh, in, and trust that to invest this additional cost, maybe 10, 15 or 20% more with the expectation that the savings are gonna come in the future. And this is where a lot of challenges come uh, and a lot of lack of trust or risk is perceived in terms of energy efficiency. Another factor uh, that is affecting uh, energy efficiency is that normally is competing with other investment opportunities. So for example, in the case of the commercial and industrial sector, normally these type of investments compete with the core business of the company in things that the uh, investor uh, is familiar with in terms of the risk and the return. So putting an analogy, this is like having a farmer that uh, uh, is, is growing uh, sheep or, 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 or pigs uh, and uh, uh, suddenly you, you want to convince this farmer that instead of investing in, in these animals, uh, they invest in a, in a sustainable energy product where they don't understand neither the risk or the return. So this is where we normally are competing and as well it happens in the public sector and as well happen at the residential sector. Uh, the next and, and uh, the last point is uh, the, the current context that we cannot uh, disregard, which is the, the current economic uh, crisis and the COVID situation. I think one of the learnings that we have seen in the last years is that uh, energy efficiency in general uh, can be a very good uh, solution to boost the economy, to increase productivity and create jobs. Uh, and as well, one of the things that we have seen is that uh, it's a good moment to, to, uh, to try to convince the different actors to put attention and prioritize energy efficiency. Normally, when there's a time of, of bonanza, when the things are growing and the economy, the economy is growing, no one is thinking in terms of saving energy. Uh, normally, everybody's thinking to grow and to invest more in, 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 uh, in production or, or, or other other type of things. When it's time of crisis, normally it's people is when start looking and, and in investing in things that can save money and can increase productivity. So this is a good time to, to look for programs related with uh, energy efficiency. Next one, please. This is just to, to give you a little bit of flavor of the how normally the market tends to see energy efficiency. This is only a, a, an economic analysis of a air conditioning system that was done uh, in the Caribbean uh, that shows the different costs uh, that are uh, incurred during a 12 years period of time. Uh, if you can see in this uh, Apple graphic, um, you can see that one, the, the smaller slide, it represents actually the cost of the equipment, which in this case is around 6% of, uh, of, of the total uh, uh, pie. And the rest of the costs are related with maintenance and operational cost, which means that uh, most of the people actually is not looking the whole picture of energy efficiency uh, cost. They only tend to see the initial investments that they need to, to do for uh, the, the equipments, and they uh, disregard the whole operational uh, and maintenance cost that this equipment will have in the future. And that's a very important aspect that we need to change. Uh, and we, we need to change this behavior of trying to prioritize just the cost of the equipment. Next one, please. I, I, I use normally this analogy to um, exemplify what, what implies in terms of energy efficiency, uh, to move energy efficiency and to scale up investments. And I want to do imagine this donkey and that you have two possibilities to move this donkey. You have the, the stick and you have the carrot. In this analogy, the stick will be the policies and regulation in place 
if, if you have a, a government or a state or a public entity that tomorrow says, okay, uh, we, we must have 50% uh, of energy efficiency and there's going to be a penalty or there's going to be a tax, well, then the, the donkey is going to move and the energy efficiency investments are going to flow. The issue that we have mainly is that we don't have this very strong policy or regulation in place. So what we must have in the other side is a very attractive carrot. Um, and that, uh, next one, please. And the, the, and the challenge is that that donkey has many carrot possibilities, uh, to put it in this word. So they have many different options on, on investment opportunities, as I was saying before. So here the challenge is how do you make this carrot that is called energy efficiency more attractive than the other carrots that uh, this donkey has uh, opportunity? And this is where we uh, are going to hear in the next uh, in the next uh, minutes some uh, mechanisms and, and financial business models on how we are trying to approach uh, this uh, situation in the different sectors in the in the residential in the commercial. Uh, from PwC, they are going to talk about the, the, uh, the public sector. So I, I'm, I'm going to finish here my, my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for your very concise introduction to energy efficiency financing. We can move to the next slide. Our, great. Our speakers now will present mechanism business models that allow to make energy efficiency investments more attractive. We will start with financing mechanism targeting specifically the residential sector with Aurélien Pillet. Aurélien is a senior climate finance specialist at BASE, working to accelerate the uptake of energy efficient equipment in, in, in the residential sector in several African countries. Aurélien, over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, hi everybody. So I will be focusing on the residential part uh, of the equation, if I may say, uh, going through different financing mechanism and business model uh, that have been uh, very effective all around the world, uh, targeting different market segments and country contexts, um, and which have been really impactful in promoting investment in all kinds of energy efficient appliances, as well as retrofitting for, for house, houses uh, all around the world. So first of all, um, the experience has shown that there are many different sources of funding and types of financing in the residential uh, sector to promote investment in energy efficiency. Um, usually sources of funding are typically national or subnational entities uh, when it comes to promoting energy efficient in the residential sector uh, or promoting investment from households. Uh, the common types of financing and sources uh, of, of funding for residential uh, energy efficiency usually come from different institutions such as the banking institutions, uh, local financial institutions, commercial banks, microfinance, but also in some cases, utility themselves. Um, and though th there are also other financing instruments uh, that can indirectly benefit the residential sector, uh, coming from national development bank, multilateral development bank, uh, pension funds in some instance, and guarantee institutions. And those are offering different sorts of financing, such as credit, leasing, credit guarantees, and grants. Always in uh, the idea of providing the right incentive to the households, to the, the target market segment of a, of a context, of an economy, and also finding ways to leverage uh, financing that is uh, available or lowering risk for those different actors. Next, please. Um, Regarding the different models uh, that have been affecting all around the world, there are many type of business models and financing mechanism. Uh, today in this presentation, I will focus mostly on two very innovative financing mechanisms uh, that has been very effective for households in promoting energy efficient and climate friendly appliances, um, such as the green on wage financing and the on build financing. But but beyond that, there are many other examples of effective ways to promote the investment, uh, such as the loans from uh, local uh, financial institutions and commercial banks, green credit lines that are usually offered by multilateral 
the development bank or international financiers to local financial institutions to promote investment specifically on green uh, green solutions on preferential terms uh, there are also cases of dealer financing which include directly the technology providers uh, offering different consumer financing uh, to promote uh, specific uh, energy efficient appliances that complied with uh, key technical uh, requirements. Also, we have seen uh, throughout uh, the, the different cases uh, the importance of microfinance institutions uh, in least developed countries uh, where you try to target segment of population that have not access to uh, standard banking due to high level of um, of uh, like high barrier of entry in, in the sector uh, or or collateral that are usually requested by those commercial banks uh, so microfinance can also play a very important role promoting energy efficiency uh, such as energy efficient lighting uh, for a uh, low income uh, segment of the population uh, there are also cases where uh, we use what we call positive lists to build trust in the market, uh, uh, where we basically certify the um, the, uh, the effectiveness of uh, certain type of equipment that are complying with key requirements and specs, uh, and that are put on positive list or approved list of product, and only those products can then be um, available for energy efficient financing through different means. Uh, there have been also cases of saving groups where instead of going uh, through uh, the normal banking sector or financial sector uh, it's actually members themselves who are uh, lending to each other to promote energy efficiency products and then the the the, the income of those savings are reinvested in further uh, energy efficiency investment. Uh, we have seen also many cases of build procurement where you try to uh, basically um, create a, 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 an important uh, demand which basically will, uh, will also drive up the, the supply and permit to, to really uh, achieve economy of scale when uh, procuring uh, energy efficiency appliances in the market. There are very uh, interesting cases in, in India, for instance, of bulk procurement that have been extremely effective with ESL uh, and other many models. But I will not go through them. Uh, next slide. And I will focus first on, on two case studies that are very innovative. Those are market-based approach. So first of all, uh, I will discuss the green on wage financing, which is a very new sort of approach in promoting energy efficient uh, appliances uh, in, in markets. Um, the idea is basically to offer flexible and simple repayment terms for sustainable energy products through salary deduction. So the green on wage financing is a way to basically um, meet the short and medium term financing needs of a certain segment of the population, in this case, salaried employees of public or private institutions that are um, that are basically working for institutions that are profiled or have a business relationship with local financial institutions. Uh, next slide, please. This model uh, is, uh, is sort of a mix of different components and it goes through a very logical process. Uh, first of all, it implies many different actors. Uh, we have on one side the technology providers of energy efficient appliances, on the other side the banks, local financial institutions, it could be also microfinance institutions, and of course the employers or employment institutions of salaried employees who will be also sort of guaranteeing uh, the repayment of their customer through the mechanism. And to go through the steps very quickly, first it starts with the vendors who are basically offering what we call certified um, high efficiency system. It could be appliances, cooling appliances, refrigerators, lighting, all sorts of energy equipment. And they basically also, in some instances, uh, not only 
uh, propose the delivery of those products to the customer, but also offer ways to collect uh, old appliances through take-back scheme. Um, and in this case, we will also see the inclusion of actors such as e-waste management companies or take-back operators playing a role in the system, in the mechanism. Uh, and then basically, uh, it's very simple for the end consumers. They will just apply through uh, the vendors to acquire any of the register system. Uh, and they will be uh, basically um, uh, just filling out an application with those vendors and they will be able to apply for a credit, a green credit to acquire those systems. And then they will basically uh, commit to repay through uh, their, uh, their salary, through their wage uh, on uh, a certain time period that is defined with the local financial institutions. And, 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 and in case of, of a default from one of these customers, it's actually the profile institution who will be uh, willing to guarantee the repayment. So either they will be doing what we call bulk repayment on behalf of all the employees who are benefiting from a loan through the green and wage financing, or they will just uh, cover the repayment in case of default. And uh, this is uh, going to be very effective for the employee because they don't have to pay for the upfront cost of uh, investing in a premium energy efficient appliances and they just have to repay on a monthly basis and usually those monthly repayment will be more or less equal to the savings that they will be achieving if replacing our old appliances uh, in this case if they go through a take back uh, process as part of a green on wage financing and a key aspect also of the green on wage financing is uh, the, the set of incentives. So on one end, the vendor will be working with the, the banks, the partner banks uh, in the green on wage financing to do what we call uh, a bulk negotiation offering rebates uh, that will be used to also uh, improve the conditions, the lending condition of the, of the product to the end consumer. And also they will offer what we call incentives, direct incentives uh, in the form of voucher uh, or else to the end consumer uh, to incentivize the return of end of life appliances through, through, through such a program. Next, please. Uh, in terms of the benefits, uh, I already touched upon some of them. Uh, the, the main benefits are that the mechanism will ease the repayment and avoid the upfront capital cost for the end consumers, which is uh, probably the key benefit of that approach and the key idea beyond uh, designing a financial mechanism or a business model in the residential sector. It will also ease the access to credit as the loan terms offered by the local financial institution are usually more attractive. And, um, and, and as I mentioned, due to the rebate negotiation with the participating technology providers and vendors. Uh, and this aspect of easing the credit, as, the credit access is really key in many contexts and emerging economies in particular, where traditional commercial banks tend to ask for uh, strict collaterals and conditions to assess the credit capacity of a customer. So through that mechanism, you can really streamline that process and ease the access to credit. And also it can be, um, it can be a mechanism that, that work with not only commercial banks, but also microfinance institutions. So we can also target different segments of a, of a market. Also the, the, the green on wage financing um, proves to improve the monitoring and reporting of green loans, uh, which is a key aspect for the local financial institutions who wish to participate in such a program, uh, because through the ap application of strict uh, monitoring, um, um, uh, reporting and verification guidelines, they can really track the co-benefits of, of, of selling energy efficient products and, and financing uh, those, uh, those products. And it's a very important way for them as well to attract and leverage climate financing uh, from uh, multilateral development banks and international financiers and green climate funds. Uh, also for the technology providers, it's a way to boost sales of products that are usually more expensive. They are sold 
at a premium compared to less efficient products. So it really opened new opportunities uh, and a new market for those customers and, and for those technology providers. And um, also finally, the, the green on wage financing really facilitate the creation of a pipeline for sustainable energy investment and of an access to new, new green markets for all the partners involved in the mechanism. Next slide, please. In particular, uh, the green on which financing has been um, sort of um, rolled out and, and designed in, uh, in Ghana uh, in, in partnership with uh, BASE, um, United Nations Environmental Programme United for Efficiency Initiative, with support from the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Programme, uh, and of course, working closely with the government of Ghana, uh, we had the opportunity to develop and operationalize the concept, um, which led us to the launch of the initiative uh, with different partners from the private sector, including commercial banks and technology providers of uh, reputable uh, brand models of refrigerators and ACs in the country. And this initiative is called the ECOWAS Refrigerators and Air Conditioners Initiative, the Eco Fridges Go, uh, Go Green Save Money. That's the slogan. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the first time the mechanism has been conceptualized and operationalized and will be rolled out in the next month. Next, please. Um, in terms of the expected outcome of this initiative, um, it's, it's really been proven through different financial and economic analysis, cost-benefit analysis, uh, that there are huge opportunities through that mechanism uh, to accelerate the adoption of energy-efficient and climate-friendly domestic refrigerators and room air conditioners uh, in order to save consumer money, uh, save on the electricity bill, and also helping the country to relieve demand on the poor sector, and of course mitigating the impact of the environment. Uh, through this program, through the Ecofridges uh, Go program, um, the uh, analysis has shown by, the, by 2023, we could expect the local financial institutions that are partnering with this initiative to unlock uh, close to 11 million uh, US dollars in financing in Ghana to support over 15,000 more sustainable cooling appliances uh, and also helping replace some of those appliances. Um, I, already touched upon some of the key components of a green on wage financing mechanism and in particular uh, i will be going through some of the key aspects of the green on wage financing in in ghana the eco Fujisco program so first of all it's the, the central piece is the green consumer finance loan that is being developed in partnership with local financial institutions um, where basically you want to develop with them a product that is really customized to this program, um, leveraging what we call the vendor bulk uh, rebates that have been uh, offered by the participating vendors. And this rebate is basically a percentage of the selling price of the appliances that are certified by the program and sold through the mechanism. So the vendors see this as a great opportunity to actually promote and market new products through a program and therefore, they, they are willing to offer uh, sort of a rebate to the program to uh, promote the different components. And one of them is really the financing. And through that rebate, we can work with the local financial institutions to offer preferential lending features. And, and as well, um, part of the rebate is used to uh, support what we call the take back scheme and recycling, which is also uh, a key aspect of, of the program, which is being operationalized with the support from the government, as well as uh, private sector companies, uh, reputable US management companies uh, to help the consumer return the end of life appliances. Um, and in doing so, they will be incentivized as part of the rebate negotiated with the vendors, they will be incentivized uh, and we will give them a voucher in also in the form of a percentage of the selling price uh, of the new equipment to return the old appliances. Also, a very central aspect of the green 
consumer finance loan is of course this this idea of facilitating the repayment so we are talking about on wage repayments so the salary can deduct the uh, repayment on their uh, their salary on their wage uh, the idea is that either the banks will be doing this directly on their uh, on their account in partnership with their employers or the employers will directly deduct it in bulk uh, at the source as well as part of the the development and the operationalization of this mechanism uh, there are uh, many aspects uh, such as agreements, standardized agreement that are put in place, finance agreement different, between the different actors, between the technology providers, the banks, to set up what we call the credit facilities, which basically enable the consumer to go directly to a technology provider, uh, fill out a form, and then if deemed eligible, uh, they can basically get the delivery of the appliances directly to them uh, without having to pay the upfront, cons up upfront cost of the appliances. So if you look at the scheme here, it shows you all the money flows as well as good flows as part of the mechanism. As you know by now, the key, as the key actors uh, involved in this mechanism are the technology providers, could be retailers, vendors, distributors of uh, energy efficient appliances. On one hand, you have the local financial institutions. Uh, you have, of course, the consumers, the profile institutions employing those consumers because we're targeting salaried employees to really lower the risk of default for those local financial institutions. And, and also a government body or entity who usually play the role of supervising uh, the model. And in the case of Ghana, it's the Energy Commission of Ghana who is playing that very important compliance role and supervision role of the mechanism, sustaining the, the program beyond uh, the technical assistance that was provided to develop the mechanism. Uh, and in terms of the different step, it's very logical process. Um, basically, the, application, the applicant will send the application form, um, to the vendors. The vendors will then uh, get in touch with the bank to check the, 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 uh, the uh, credit capacity of that customers and eligibility based on those partnership with profile institutions. Once deemed approved and eligible, the customer will pick up the product or getting a delivery. Uh, it will be also able to, um, to uh, drop uh, end-of-life appliances at this point the vendor will basically provide a voucher to the consumers and then the consumers can just start uh, repaying on a monthly basis on his salary uh, for, for the acquisition of those systems. Uh, next, please. Um, now, I would like to also introduce you to another financial mechanism, which has been also proven very effective, uh, very innovative. It's a fully market-based approach. And this mechanism is called the on-bill financing. So we are talking about a mechanism that really uh, use part of the component of the green on-wage financing, uh, but introduce a new key actor, key stakeholder in the process, which is the national electricity company or the power utility, who will be helping recovering the loan repayments uh, of, 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 uh, through the program, through the electricity bill of the end consumer. So the on-bill financing can really as well help accelerating the adoption of energy efficient and climate friendly appliances, all sorts of sustainable energy products in the residential sectors. And the, the whole idea of this mechanism and the key difference compared to the green on wage is that we are not only targeting salaried employees, but we are, we are targeting electricity consuming um, uh, households or micro entrepreneurs. So we are basically extending the range uh, of the, the market segment that can be uh, targeted through that mechanism. Uh, of course, on one hand, you open the market to more uh, potential uh, beneficiaries, but on the other hand, you also have to deal with a new, with a new actor, the power uh, utility, to, to make it viable. And the whole idea is to offer significant benefits to households uh, by, as the green on wage financing, providing them a green loan, um, uh, easing the repayment, 
this time through the electricity bill and uh, trying to reduce the monthly expenses of these uh, households uh, so that it doesn't feel uh, the impact of, of replacing uh, old appliances by a new energy efficient one. Uh, in terms of the stakeholders, as I mentioned, um, it's really built on uh, a set of key partnerships. The first one is between the utility and the partner financial institutions usually, uh, which provide uh, basically uh, the, the capital to the utilities clients uh, for the equipment to be financed through the on bill financing. And the utility will be then collecting, as I said, the household payment through the electricity bills uh, that are either depositing in a trust or directly um, repaid to the bank through the utility. So the utility will play that role and do bulk repayment for all the beneficiaries on a frequent basis that is set usually uh, in partnership with the bank. And to avoid credit default, the utility will be usually requested to suspend the service according to usual practices in case of a client uh, does not pay his bill or her bill uh, on the assigned debt. So this is usually done for what we call post-paid customers. Um, and in the case of prepaid customers, this idea of, of, um, of uh, stopping the electricity services for default customer is sort of automatized usually in the um, management information system of the utility, which makes the, the process even easier in terms of, of legal implications. Um, for the business models, uh, it's all about the principle of bill neutrality and how you basically convert the electricity savings on, on a powerful uh, idea and incentive for the consumers to invest in energy efficient uh, appliances. The idea is basically that the bill payment of energy consumption are basically your current energy consumption. So you may be, uh, you may be owe a couple of appliances, uh, a fridge, maybe an AC, and, but those are highly consuming products as Daniel mentioned. So by replacing one of them, you can actually save quite much on your electricity bill. Um, replacing an old product by a new one, a new energy efficient one, can help you achieve uh, usually up to 40% of energy savings. Uh, so when you replace your equipment, old appliance by a new one, you will be, um, you will be achieving electricity savings. And the thing is, going through the program, you will basically get uh, a loan from one of the partner institutions, and then you will only have to repay uh, the loan on monthly installment or frequent installment on your electricity bill. So in a perfect scenario, your monthly loan repayment will be equal to your monthly uh, energy savings. So you won't see any difference on your electricity bill. So that's the very powerful idea of the on-bill financing, and that's also what drives the interest of financial institutions who see it as a very low risk sort of recovery mechanism uh, to promote investment in energy efficiency. Next slide, please. Sorry, Aurelia, can you maybe wrap up as we're running a bit out of time? Absolutely. So for the benefits of the on-bill, as I mentioned, it's really about redistributing the risk. Uh, it's proven very effective, very low uh, default rate. It's finally self-sufficient. It's usually aligned with the policy framework. It's very effective for small investment, like replacing a refrigerator or lightning. Uh, and it really gives a uh, very uh, easy um, loan repayment uh, sort of a mechanism to the end consumers. And it all opens new business opportunity for the utility, the institutions. Uh, for instance, the UT can really through such a program, uh, achieve long-term uh, co-benefits in terms of avoided uh, power generation consumption uh, and, and really help manage better the domain at the country level. Next slide, please. Um, very briefly, uh, this on-bill mechanism is not new. It's been already operationalized and implemented in different countries very successfully, for instance, in Tunisia, as well in Mexico. 
And at the moment, uh, the, 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 the on-bill financing mechanism has been also um, sort of operationalized in Senegal uh, through the EcoFridge uh, project that I mentioned earlier, where we developed the green on wage in Ghana. And here in Senegal, uh, we're developing the uh, EcoFridge Senegal program uh, with the on-bill financing as a central piece in collaboration with uh, Senelec, the national electricity company, uh, technology providers, and uh, also partner commercial banks, uh, as well as the government, uh, RMO and DEC as leading compliance entities. Next slide, please. And the, the whole idea of this mechanism is really to replicate some of those key components that I described as part of the Ecofridges Co initiative in Ghana, uh, with the slightly difference that we are here uh, dealing with the national electricity utility uh, and also um, and also uh, offering the repayment through the uh, electricity bill. Uh, for the end consumers. And a key aspect that is not part of the green on wage, but part of the on bill is the assessment of the customer eligibility in a very innovative way, leveraging customer data from uh, client data from the national electricity company uh, and inputting it through a credit scoring formula that use key eligibility criteria such as uh, the level of electricity consumption, uh, the number of time a consumer has charged uh, a meter and so on to give a credit score. And it's through that credit score that we can then uh, assess the credit capacity and credit as eligibility of that customer to the program. Next slide, please. Uh, for the interactions, uh, as well, when it comes to the interaction between the consumers and the vendors, it's very similar to the Green on Wage Financing and Ecofridges Co Initiative in Ghana. The, the main difference is uh, basically the, uh, the obligation of the end consumers to repay the loan through its electricity bill. Uh, and besides uh, that, uh, the uh, the benefits and interaction money flow as well as good flows are pretty similar. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Aurélien, for the great overview of the different financing mechanisms for the residential sector and for the detailed presentation of the on-wage and non-bill financing models. Uh, I would like now to introduce Livia Mitke Morais and Carla de la Maggiora. Both Carla and Livia are senior climate finance specialists at BASE, leading the successful implementation of energy efficiency financing projects around the world. Uh, Carla and Livia will provide an overview of the different mechanisms to support investment in energy efficiency in the commercial sector. Livia, over to you. Thank you, Laura. Um, maybe we can start with the first slide. I'll give you just a brief overview on the different instruments and financing mechanism for the commercial sectors um, for increasing investment in energy efficiency, right? So here for the commercial sector, we need to take into consideration that we have a huge spectrum of uh, micro, small, medium and large enterprises. So the, really the key is that there is no silver bullet. So there is not one solution that will fit, one mechanism that will fit all of the, all of the, the, the needs and all of the characteristics of the different uh, enterprises and the sectors that they are in. So it's um, really the combination of the different mechanisms that will make uh, a difference and that will make us achieve our goals of reducing uh, emissions via energy efficiency uh, investments. So here um, we've listed a few of them, performance-based financing or special purpose vehicles. There are usually for uh, larger, um, larger, larger projects, uh, credit, leasing, equity, convertible debts that are for all sizes of, of projects, revolving funds, where someone takes a loan to invest in energy efficiency and then the repayment of this loan is then used to to provide loans for others so this is the concept of the revolving funds dealer and trader financing um, and um, it's it's a different one as a service business model which we will hear about 
um, shortly from, from Carla. Uh, crowd financing, risk mitigation instruments, insurance, technical insurance, um, and credit guarantees. So there are many options uh, of financing instruments that can be linked with the purpose of increasing investment in energy efficiency. The energy savings insurance model that I will talk about um, briefly to you shortly. And uh, incentives and subsidies, of course, those are all also measures like uh, what Daniel making reference a little bit to Daniel's presentations. There are the, the sticks and the carrots. So there are also ways of making carroty sticks. <laughs> um, so providing subsidies and incentives or white certificates, which are um, basically instruments where you trade the, the, the credits generated from, from the energy efficiency um, investments. So you have also a variety of different actors involved in those financing instruments. Of course, here I've listed quite a few. So from national development banks, be well, multilateral development banks, pension funds, guarantees, uh, institutions, commercial banks and insurance companies as well. So each, each uh, actor also has a, a role to play there. And you also have the non-financial institutions contributing to, to the, the mechanisms, uh, intergovernmental agencies, government agencies, NGOs, and civil society. So there is a lot of work to do also in capacity building, raising awareness, or for the, the governmental agencies setting up the regulatory framework. Um, so I'll talk about the energy savings insurance model which is one of the, the models that we at BASE, we, we've created it with the Inter-American Development Bank. So it's been operational in, in Latin America. That's also where the case studies will, will be, will show you. And um, this model tackles specifically the risk perception, the, the perception of the high risk of energy efficiency investment that Daniel also mentioned before. And it's um, also developed for small and medium-sized enterprises. So the SMEs, they are usually like above 90% of, of the companies in a country. And um, uh, we really want, to, want them to also be part of this transition to energy efficiency. So this model was also designed to, uh, for them. So uh, involving standardized elements, to, to be simple and to be easy for, for, for them to, to understand. So the four elements are a standardized contract, that it's this agreement between technology provider and the final client, the SME, where the savings are guaranteed. So this perception that the future energy savings will not be achieved are guaranteed in the contract by the provider. And this guarantee is covered by the insurance. So this is where the second element comes in. So an insurance company comes and covers and says like, okay, if the, the savings are not achieved, the provider will respond. If the provider doesn't respond, there is an insurance that will respond. So this is to create this trust. Since um, there is also the third element, that is the technical validation process. So this is also to reduce the perceived risk of the technical aspects of the project. And it's important also for the insurance company because um, they can be sure in an arbitration process if the savings were achieved or not. The technical validation entity can can um, can can intervene as an arbiter, and also in the beginning of the project, tell uh, to the client uh, that the savings promised by the provider are going to be achieved, so they are technically feasible. The fourth element is the financing. So um, th this, is, this is the combination of all the, the elements of the energy savings insurance model. So financing ideally with uh, favorable conditions, with green credit lines and all those um, advantages since it is um, less risky with an insurance. 
the financing structure of um, the energy savings insurance model, it works like this. So the payment is done by the SME to the technology provider. So there is this higher upfront cost by the SME to the technology provider, but the, 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 the risk perception that those savings will not be achieved, that the long run, um, the cost will be reduced is through all those elements uh, guaranteed. So it's the guarantee by the provider and the insurance coverage. Um, the, so financial institutions here play the role of providing the loan and the, the or, or leasing in the, the financing to the SME. And um, that's where we, we have been working with, for example, the Inter-American Development Bank, setting up this model in Colombia and Mexico and many other Latin American countries. So the multilateral development bank giving the financing to, to um, local banks, development banks, or at the end, commercial banks. And um, to set up this, this model, as you notice, there are those, those elements and a lot of stakeholders involved. We, we usually go through a process like the market assessment, development of the elements, engaging all the key actors, capacity building and promotion strategies. And all of those elements or setting up this model is where technical assistance comes in. And that's what we at BASE, we, we have been doing. And uh, not only with the Inter-American Development Bank, but we also have the, this project ESI Europe running in Europe with the fundings of the European Commission. So this is uh, our approach to uh, come with this innovative business model or financing mechanism to increase energy efficiency investments. So maybe now I can go to the briefly to the two case studies. Yeah, so this is a case of a, a hotel in Colombia. So they replaced their old spoiler system by by solar panel um, solar panel heaters. Yeah, solar water heaters in the roof. So there you can can see at this investment uh, reduced by 70% their, their energy efficiency. So here the role um, was to support the technology provider in the implementation of the program. So um, going through this process of the technical validation of the project and then um, making the connections with the insurance companies that have developed and the, or have the, this, this insurance product ready for, for them. So, um, and, and the, the financing then provided via the Inter-American Development Bank to the local commercial bank. So this is an example where the payback is less than three years. So it's, it's pretty much, uh, it's very good in terms of, of investments. Second case study is the, is the hospital in, in Colombia as well. So there they also replace their old uh, solar water heating system by a new one and a backup system. So instead of being diesel, now it's with, with heat pumps. So it's also introducing like energy efficiency and renewable energies. They are very much interlinked and very important to be taken into consideration to, to, for climate change solutions. And here it was a slightly higher investment, so uh, around 200,000 uh, US dollars, and which also implying an a bit longer payback. Um, but the, the savings are still guaranteed by the provider. They also went through all the, the process of the ESI model implementation. So, um, and and this is how how the the case study of the ESI model. I think now that was my last slide, so I'll hand over to to Carla to talk a little bit about the privatization model. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, and welcome everyone. Basically, I'm, <laughs> the benefit of time, I'm just gonna jump straight, and I'm gonna really focus more on the explanation of the model. I did bring some case studies, but we have a wonderful website with tons of information, case studies available, so any further details, you can always access them there. First of all, the idea of a service is like, as you hear, you, like a consumer, gets a service instead of buying an equipment. And that is really important because we're changing the, 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 the business model completely. Why? Because when, let's say, the service 
in the case of cooling as a service in particular, some, a service provider brings you like a cooling equipment to give you cooling and also provides the maintenance operation, but also even pays for the electricity, any kind of utility, water, electricity needed, you're giving something very special. Now it makes business sense for that provider to seek efficiency. And that's the game changer in, the, in this model. Why? Because as we Daniel mentioned before, he gave the example of the air conditioning in the Caribbean that we saw that 6% more or less was the actual investment cost and all the rest is sort of maintenance and uh, utilities. So now the provider who's the expert on the technology has this sort of the whole life cycle cost analysis in its head. And what, what does it make sense that the, the service that's going to be the best one in terms of the cheapest is going to be the most efficient. So you're making by by offering stabilization now, it makes business sense to the provider to put you the most efficient equipment and then also to uh, change a lot the concept of, oh, let's fix when something is broken. We fix, like, we don't fix, we prevent any kind of, of a breakage. So we move from a, like a, a corrective to a preventive maintenance. And that's really important again, because that translates at the end into, into efficiencies. Um, I think that's something that really important that I wanted to mention also is that when you have the provider maintaining the ownership of an equipment, what happens now is that they have also, it's not just about owning that equipment, trying to make it the most efficient, providing the best maintenance, it's also they start thinking more in a systemic way. What do I mean by this? For instance, let's say that you're in a country where the electricity is cheaper at night, that usually is the case. So maybe the, the provider may start thinking, okay, I'm gonna put some kind of thermal storage why? Because I can produce the, the cooling at night when it's cheaper and then store it and bring that cooling the next day. That before wouldn't happen. It would be really rare because for like a consumer it would be out of its core like business. And the other thing, and we're going to see a case, is that when you're in a place that the, the electricity is not sort of constant, the, the, the flow of electricity, you have blackouts and things like that, uh, for the, the provider, now that he's offering a service, you know, can you stay in the same slide, please? Uh, for the provider, like it's really, really important that the service is gonna be available. And that means that the electricity needs to be available. So in that case, they could consider the idea of installing renewable energy, okay? That, that's why we say in this case, very, very quickly, we saw that now it makes business sense for the providers to like to be efficient, of course, that efficiency translates into better service and better prices for the customer, and the efficiency translates into um, uh, reduced emissions, and that's why we say that line on top, that is the business model aligns people, profit, and the planet, okay? Uh, very quickly, also jumping into the circular economy thing, like servitization is a key component of circular economy for several aspects. One, efficiency, we just covered that. Second is the maximize the utilization of components. As I said before, now the provider has, the, because it's the owner, can start thinking systemically and it's going to adapt depending on the needs of the different users. That means that can move equipment around. It's always going to keep, like, think if you keep it in storage of equipment and then it's like, how do you allocate it in the best way? And that's extremely important. And third is the fact that because, again, it's the owner of the equipment and is in charge of doing any kind of maintenance, it's going to try to maximize the easiness of making maintenance and also the easiness at the end of the, the, the life of the equipment, how do I reuse components or I recycle components? So the whole concept of modularity comes in hand and that's extremely important. Another element that I want to, and it's the last line there, servitization is different from an energy savings contract. And this is really clear in the sense that here you don't need to measure savings. The provider, of course, estimates savings because that's the way they, they need to price the, the, the product, the service in this case. But it's not something that you need to measure every year and then come into some kind of agreement or discussion, negotiation with the end customer to decide how this thing is split. Okay, because usually you can even have pre-agreed that you're going to split it, let's say, 60-40, but at the end of the day, let's say that you're more efficient and you have more savings, for the end user, it's going to be rather tricky to say, why do I need to give you more of my savings? So that's really important. So it's really different for energy saving contract. The last thing, just to give some also credibility to the model, not just because it's, it's been working for several years, but is the fact that in 2019, we did get the, the endorsement of the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance as one of the most innovative business models to accelerate climate finance. So with that said, can we go to the next one, please? So basically now I'm going to mention these are the main three stakeholders. That doesn't mean that there are other stakeholders. We have on one side the cooling users, 
the technology providers that more than technology providers now are favorite service providers and then we have the investors or banks as i said before what's the advantage now for like an end user you don't have to invest anything zero then uh, you don't have like so you move all your capex your capital expenditure into an operational expenditure and because now you're like they're installing you the most efficient technologies let's say you had something that was not efficient before you're even going to be experiencing savings translated into that price of the service another important element and this is really key we we saw also from daniel we heard from daniel, daniel this whole thing of perceived risk how to manage that and here it is a full but full transfer of performance risk towards the provider why because if this thing doesn't perform the ones paying for electricity is the provider not the user so that's really really key you pay based on a fee agree at the beginning of the contract and maybe there's like clauses depending on the place where you are where that fee can be adjusted like based on like a consumer price index or energy price index etc in the case of the technology providers, as I said, now they're able to put out there the most competitive, the, the most efficient technologies and really make it competitive in the market, of course, by that, providing something that is different and is very convenient because consumers do not need to, to invest. Uh, in this case, they will have like now a crew, like a, like a steady state of sort of revenue streams. And that's really, really important because you, you change also your relationship. It's not about selling and then maybe having a service and um, a, operate, a maintenance contract is really establishing this partnership with the, with the client. And then the last one is the banks and investors that this is a great opportunity for great funding. Like we know there are money is there and usually it's the last project because there's always the risk perception of risk. This is bringing something that, first of all, is giving you your finance an asset that is generating cash flow, and that's extremely important. And there are different ways to do this. And we're going to go to the next slide, please, to describe this. I, I put here only one of the examples that we have in terms of like um, providing a financing for the for, for, for the, the cooling as a service. Next slide, please. Uh, and in this case, is the creation of a, like an SPV in which basically we put in a pot of money, a common pot of money that maybe it's going to be a bank, it's going to be investors, it could be the same technology provider there that they put this pool of money. And with that pool of money, they're going to be one hand, they're going to be buying the equipment, entering into a service like agreement with that provider, technology provider. And then offering, they're going to be the ones uh, signing the cooling as a service contract with the final user. In this case, we have on the right three contracts as an example. You can bundle many more contracts like that. And then, they, in, as I told you before, it could be the investor, technology provider being part of the SPD or technology provider just as the role of the provider. This, we can make it even stronger if we bring on board like a payment guarantee that somehow secures or partially secures the payment in case that there is default by the customers. But as we said before, think of someone that is running, let's say, a hotel or a hospital that they need. This is like a needed um, input, like the, the fact of having cooling. So at the end of the day, without the cooling, they cannot continue operating. So the chances of having something like that, the risks are quite, are quite like reduced. Can we go to the next one, please? That's going to be the case studies. And this one, I'm really going to go fast in the sense that, as I told you, we have a great website, it's cas-initiative.org, or you can go through the base website also, energy-base.org, and access. We have the case studies, we have news, we have access in December, we had an e-summit with like 12 hours of videos and stuff like that. And all that information, all that material is still available until the end of this year, and you can access it for free. We, I'm going to just mention briefly, a study of one of our incubator companies in India. This is under development, but we hope it's going to launch in, in, in April 2021, in a couple of months. Basically, it's from the company Cool Crop, and what they're doing is installing these sort of like cold storage, the big capacity ones, and they're going to be charging this in a specific area for the production of apples, and they're going to be charging based on the usage. And they're in the whole negotiation agreement of how it's going to be done, etc. But that's sort of the, the, the idea of of, of what's going to happen here. People are going to be paying for the amount of, let's say, of apples, maybe it may be a crate or apples, and depending on the length of stay, they pay a fee for that. They don't have to pay the, for the capital cost of having this equipment there. And on that hand, I want to, I just included the pictures on the right side, the coal house, coal storage in Nigeria. This is a, basically, it's a very similar like model, but instead of India, it's in Nigeria. This model in Nigeria has been operating for a few years already. They have several coal storage currently available and the impact has been really really relevant because we are talking about like food saving 
are 50 percent plus increase in income for people because now they're not forced to sell today they can sell tomorrow as well and the, the, the associated like reductions in, in emissions in this case particularly they generated a lot of employment especially for women and i wanted to mention also the case study we have on the bottom uh, right corner why because this shows how pooling as a service and servitization in general is, can be applied to a wide spectrum of possibilities we saw sort of the cold storage areas but now we see here this is a real estate case where we had schools office buildings, shopping malls, everything, everything provided through a cooling as a service. And in this case in particular, even all the electricity is generated from uh, solar panels. And why was the decision to generate from solar panels in addition to big green and everything is because with that, the provider sort of ensures that the, the, the availability of electricity and the price of that availability of electricity. As I told you before, now the providers are thinking differently. Before they would have sold the equipment without thinking anything else. So with that having said, I want to sort of like leave you, like invite you to our website, as I said before. And I do want to mention two key things that I, before I close my, my talk, it has to be with, like Aurelia mentioned it at one point. The, the kind of instrument that we uh, develop are market-based uh, approach instrument. And that means that at the end of the day, they rely on market instruments. And the key element of that is that as base, we play a technical assistant role at the beginning, but then this should be picked up and can be picked up by the market and continue on their own. That's a key issue when you're talking about development aid and stuff like that, that usually, okay, the money is there, everything happens fine and beautiful, and then the money is gone, everything drops off. This is something very different, and that's why it's so important to be working with market based mechanics. And the last thing is the COVID element. As we said, like right now, the, the possibility for someone to uh, have access to better technologies, to basically uh, the, sub, the inputs that they need provided with better technologies that they are having to invest is great because there's no investment, but also there's the chances of reduced operational costs. And so servitization is a key element, it's a key business model to really revamp the economy after, in a post-COVID world. With that, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Livia and Carla, for the very insightful presentation on the servitization model and on the energy saving insurance. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Rajiv Galan, that will present financing mechanism for the public sector uh, with case studies from India. Rajiv is the executive director of PwC India, leading numerous projects on energy efficiency appliances and buildings. And Rajiv, if I could ask you to wrap up your presentation by 10.55 so we can have some time for question afterward. Thank you. Can you hear me properly? Yes, we can Am I hear you. Am I audible? Okay, thanks. So, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, so, so, I am Rajiv, uh, part of PwC team, uh, having more than 20 years of experience in this segment uh, and closely uh, associated with many stakeholders in this area. Uh, and, and why I'm here today, uh, th thank you CTCN for inviting me to share my experience. I'm so delighted to hear uh, uh, base case studies, uh, last one as a cooling as a service, we all are talking about, we all understand cooling as one big area. So it's, it's, it's exciting to see many new things. So what I'm going to talk today here is that uh, we all have been discussing about different business models uh, this financing discussion is not new maybe the terminology is changing with time but the intent remains the same uh, so uh, as we so as we worked closely in india as well as so for example i personally have been involved in energy efficiency journey in more than 30 countries so maybe i'll bring some experience uh, developing countries, developed countries, that what I feel is are the key drivers or are the barriers. Just for the audience, maybe to just think about uh, how do we move forward. So for me, uh, the first real question here is that because I worked with policymakers, I worked with implementers, I worked with financing institutions and maybe many nonprofits as well. Uh, so one thing which is which requires some kind of a introspection here is that uh, what is more important financing or demand 
or are we saying that uh, financing plus uh, demand is the key growth driver or will be the key growth growth driver uh, for future so that's where i see this whole uh, financing story for last so many years people started talking about awareness people started talking about money is not available people started talking about technologies are not there but at the same time let me be very candid here that i have seen that sometimes the financing is available but it is not utilized properly so how do we bridge this balance so my presentation is all about sharing my views and taking forward the uh, very useful points uh, highlighted by our base team next please so no no uh, can you go back to the previous slide yeah previous please yeah so the the agenda the topic which is given to me is public sector so why public sector uh, the experience suggests that uh, public sector has played a key role in maybe driving the countries forward public sector can show commitment to the larger audience that uh, this is the way to do it and if we look at the public story public sector story in india these are the list of few sectors the buildings the municipal uh, provincial level uh, programs street lights water supply and maybe now we are talking about evs and all that everything is coming up so what are the market drivers here if i talk about india story india is slightly different from the developed world uh, in developed world people are talking about retrofits for example europe they came out with their retrofitting strategy in india because more than 50 percent of the construction if we are talking by 2030 estimates is yet to be built or we are in the process of building so our story is led by uh, the new growth followed by the retrofitting growth so we have our programs the building codes uh, for residential as well as commercial sector and we are moving forward similarly we we, we have a journey about street lights we have our smart cities programs where we are talking about and water supply is a critical component there so how do we see the so again the other dimension which i want to highlight here is uh, the difference between compliance versus ambition so compliance is the minimum standard uh, as a country uh, as an organization we need to, or as, as a facility we need to meet the ambition is that there is much more to do so do we need financing to meet do the compliance or do we need financing to take that extra step forward that's where i think that will critically uh, define the whole movement so let me for 30 seconds i'll give an uh, example of say the ecbc we call it as energy conservation building code so the ecbc minimum requirement so that is the code compliance then we have a ecbc plus and super ecbc so if we have to take forward so ecbc code will happen through compliance but ecbc plus or ecbc super which is maybe 20 30 percent more efficient can be maybe uh, based uh, by integrating some kind of uh, financing programs around this same is with street lights and the municipal programs next please so what are the critical issues here so maybe i'll not go deep into each one of it but uh, one critical thing which i have seen here is that sometimes uh, the the funds are not available sometimes funds are available but demand is not there size so aggregation of project is a very critical point so the third point if you see here this has come out as one of the barriers for banks 
they are not very keen or maybe the individual invest, investors are also not very keen uh, to go for financing and somehow that's why things are not moving forward so can we aggregate smaller projects <clears throat> that is one dimension so we, we talked about capacity of financial institutions to appraise e-projects that is another idea that can we somehow create some kind of a cells we call it as cells or teams within these institutions to take forward uh, these projects technology uh, i don't think technology is a major constraint because we have many things available in the market it's more about maybe uh, the the bulk movement we need to make it happen so somehow that is uh, that is one area which requires attention next please So brief about uh, so Bureau of Energy Efficiency India. Uh, it is the nodal agency of energy efficiency. So looking at different past experiences where various initiatives were undertaken, but somehow uh, maybe things are not that fast. So we are coming up with a financing platform uh, for building the capacity. Uh, there's an investment bazaar. We call it as market. Can we, I talked about the designated energy cells within financial institutions. We are exploring that. And maybe we'll be setting these cells in five to 10 public sector banks. Can we aggregate projects? Uh, that framework is under discussion. And we call it as some kind of energy efficiency financing platform where maybe we can link all the different initiatives under one forum. So these are the kind of initiatives, ideas, uh, which are debated. And maybe we, as a country, we are trying to take forward this agenda. Next, please. So our, our colleagues talked about a few models, so I will not repeat some of them. Uh, but if we talk about the implementation models, uh, we talk about ESCO, we talk about PMC. So ESCO can work in any way. They can maybe invest their own money or they can work as PMC as well. And there is kind of a trading model also. So in India, the one of the success story is we all, we most of them you would be aware, the ESL story, I'm not going to repeat that, which is called Energy Efficiency Services Limited. But there are many uh, provincial level government programs which are also running and maybe they are getting good success. The third dimension, which is very critical here is that uh, the financing can happen with the large consumers. So big public sector departments, which own many facilities uh, at a state level or at a country level, uh, the strategies to engage with them and maybe having some kind of implementation of these projects is very critical to take forward the energy efficiency agenda. Next, please. So what are the different financing mechanisms? Demand aggregation, I talked about that. Uh, and it fits into every aspect. We, we have seen in India that if we have demand and if we aggregate that, maybe we somehow address the financing issue as well. A performance-based financing, yes. Uh, this, is, this is getting traction. And our previous colleague talked about the insurance projects, insurance products, which is, which is very critical to give some kind of assurance uh, to different clients on bill financing is already explained. So I will not uh, go deep into that list based financing. Uh, we, we are running many programs here uh, where maybe different categories of products appliances are maybe highlighted and some kind of uh, uh, rebates are given on procurement of those appliances. Next. So maybe next two minutes, I'll briefly talk about different models. So what are different business models all have been trying? Uh, so when we talk about, so although I have mentioned the municipalities or uh, provinces here, but the idea here is that, so these are the different kind of models where uh, like in India, if as a province, we need money to invest on projects, it has to be through uh, the central agencies and different financial institutions or co-financials, uh, they provide the money. And then uh, this direct financing, uh, the, the authorities uh, maybe can engage uh, so they can set up some kind of a 
PMUs, we call it as a project monitoring unit, uh, engage different consultants and maybe they can take care of many implementation projects. Let me give you one example here. I cannot name that project, so that is work in progress, but it is not in India. Uh, so we, we are working with uh, six provinces and, 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 and the kind of investing investment opportunity we see there is that for one of the provinces, uh, they have close to 4,000 electricity connections, which means when we did our screening, they have 800 public buildings which are having a um, load greater than 500 kilowatt. It means all of them are big buildings, schools, universities, hospitals, and all of that. So if we see the investment opportunity there, uh, we are talking about 200 to 300 million USD at least in that province only. So that opens up the energy saving as well as investment opportunity uh, for different countries to follow. Next, please. So if we look at this model, this is more about the public-private partnership and this is how the model is and then we also create a viability cap financing just to take care of maybe more other expenses as well where the municipalities they can engage with ESCOs, either ESCOs can invest their own money and enter into contracts, energy saving contracts with municipalities or they can maybe share their expenses as well. So in India, we, we executed so I have a case study, so I, I'm looking at the time also because it is already so maybe I will share that case study as well. But this model again uh, is, is, is getting traction where ASCOs are investing, uh, maybe standard templates are provided. Uh, initially in India, in many countries, the, uh, uh, the M&B was a critical issue, but somehow we found out a way that maybe the deemed saving model sometimes not work always, which is a good option but maybe sometimes it, it doesn't work. So MNV every monthly MNV for projects is very critical to have these kind of contracts. Next, please. Yeah, so the next model here is the utility based model uh, that whether the national state electricity utility can they take care of this. Initially in India, we tried few models on this. Uh, I also share global experience on this. Different utilities have mixed set of uh, feelings, experiences on this. Many state utilities are very, very keen to run these programs, in, but in many countries, we have seen that the utilities are not keen to run these programs. Uh, maybe they, they have their apprehensions about that maybe their electricity business uh, will come down and all that. So this is not easy, but it's a mixed kind of a thing to run many programs on bill financing program is one of the options here. And maybe we, we, we are working on with many of the utilities to run uh, these programs where we are creating the doing the bulk procurement, helping them doing the bulk procurement aggregation and all that because they have a good customer connect. Next, please. So this this model is again uh, some uh, so uh, the government of India or the authorities are also running financing programs to through different financing uh, banks. One of the recent example here is which is not uh, uh, the uh, the what KFW the German bank. Uh, so India they came out with a residential labeling program and uh, KFW they have recently announced 250 million euro loan to state bank of india which is a government bank here and the 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 bank will be providing loans to developers who go who who actually adopt for four of <coughs> four or five star rated uh, uh, projects uh, for their facility so these kind of programs many programs with through banks in energy efficiency uh, renewable energy uh, it is in place and, and 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 they are very successful as well so this is picking up next please hi rajiv uh, i think uh, we are really running out of time and we have to wrap it up laura can you please give the closing remarks and we would be definitely putting all the presentations and taking the note of the questions and we'll be answering them laura over to you uh, yes, great. Uh, thank you, Rajiv, for your very useful presentation. We still have some time for a couple of questions, right? 
Uh, I'm afraid, but we have taken a note of it because the webinar will close at 11. So maybe you can close uh, with your closing remarks. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you very much uh, for the audience to participate to this webinar. I hope you find it useful and I hope you learn about the different types and sources of financing for sustainable energy. Um, uh, feel free to look at our website and to get in touch if you have questions or if you're interested in learning more about our projects and about our financing instruments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.